opening with prayer. Would someone please take that and open with prayer for us? I'll do it. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead then, please, William. Heavenly Father, as we come into these Sabbath hours, Lord, I pray that you give Kelly the wisdom and guidance to this message, Lord, and help him to to share it with all of us. And I ask, Lord, that we would take it to heart and apply it to our lives. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I was thinking of what to share and came across these sermons by Ellen White. And as well, I came across this poem. I thought we'd open, I'd open with this opening thought of dying to self. That's kind of what the 1888 message is about. Living to Christ and dying to self. When you are forgotten or neglected or purposely set at naught, and you don't are hurt with the insult or oversight, but your heart is happy, being worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. When your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, your advice disregarded or your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart or even to defend yourself, but take it all take it all in patient, loving silence. That is dying to self. When you lovingly, patiently bear any disorder and irregularity, any unpunctuality or any annoyance, when you come face to face with waste, folly, extravagance, spiritual insensitivity, and endure it just as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. When you are content with any food, any offering, any raiment, any climate, any society, any sol solitude, any interruption by the will of God, that is done itself. When you never refer to yourself in conversation or record your own good works or itch after commendation, when you can truly love to go unknown, that is dying to self. When you see a brother, when you see or a sister have his or her needs met and con can honestly rejoice in spirit and feel no envy nor question God while your own needs are far greater and in more desperate circumstances, that is dying to self. When you receive correction and reproof from one of less stature than yourself and can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion or resentment rising up within your heart, that is dying to self. It's attributed to Bill Britton. So let's see, uh, 1888 sermons by Ellen G. White. They're in the uh, miscellaneous collections, 1888 materials. And I'd like to, as I read, a lot of thoughts were, you know, came up in my mind about what I was reading and please I'd like this to be like something as a devotional but at the same time a sermon but at the same time feel free to stand up and comment or if you have a thought and give me patience with this uh, audio connection sometimes it lags but uh, yeah please I invite anyone to comment a living connection with God morning talk October 11 1888, Manuscript 6, 1888. I'm thankful, brethren and sisters, that God has spared me to come to this meeting. I've been sick nigh unto death, but prayer was offered by those assembled at the Oak Oakland camp meeting, and the Lord heard them. It was not by my faith, for I had none, but they exercised faith in my behalf, and the Lord gave me strength to bear my testimony to the people in Oakland, and then I started, as it were, at a venture to come on this journey. I had but one sinking spell on the way, but the Lord helped me, and when we reached Kansas City, I went out to the campground where they were holding their meeting and spoke to the people. In this I realize and know that the Lord has strengthened me 
and he shall have all the glory. Now, as we have assembled here, we want to make the most of our time. I've thought again and again that if we would make only the most of this precious oppor- of the precious opportunities God has given us, they would do us so much more good. But we too often let them slip away, and we do not realize that benefit from them which we should. My mind has been directed to the words of the Apostle Paul. He says in the 20th of Acts, beginning with verse 17, And from Miletus, Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the laying and weight of the Jews. Now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, and have showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I have thought again and again, brethren and sisters, if we were Bible believers as well as Bible readers, we would carry out just what God has given us. We would be far better than we are at the present time. But we do not realize that it is the loving voice of God speaking to us from his word. We are to think everything of it and take it home to our hearts. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 24, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What a testimony is that? Free from the blood of all men. Now here is the exhortation. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his blood. Now what is the necessity of what why? For I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Verses twenty eight and twenty nine. Brethren, if we would be in earnest, the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, sorry, if we would be in earnest, the power of the Holy Ghost would attend our efforts, and we would see a different state of things among us. We are placed in trust with the most solemn truths ever committed to mortals, but the course of some is of such a character that God cannot answer their prayers. Their prayers are offensive to His holiness. And should he hear and answer their prayers, they would be confirmed in a wrong course, and others would be led away from the straight paths. Why cannot we take the truth God has revealed and weave it into our life and character, our very life and character? If we have the Spirit of Christ in our hearts, we will have a burden for the perishing souls around us, as Paul had, and we will leave such an impression upon the young men and women who claim to believe the truth that they will feel that there are important responsibilities resting upon them. They will feel that their faith must be increased and that they must take up the work lying directly in their pathway and be a blessing to others, humble, diligent, obedient. And when they meet their associates, it will be to talk of Jesus. They will carry Jesus into their homes and testify to all of his mercy. If Christ is formed within the hope of glory, and this I have a question on, because there's no comma, and I've always read this, if Christ is formed within the hope of glory, so is it is Christ formed within, comma, the hope of glory? Or is it just read straight through? If Christ is formed within the hope of glory, is the hope of glory where Christ is formed with, I don't know, making it too complicated perhaps. If Christ is formed within the hope of glory, 
You will put away all vanity and foolish speaking. You will be sanctified through the truth. You will so labor for God that you can have an approving conscience in your ministerial work. And you can say with the devoted St. Paul that you are clean from the blood of all men. Men. But you cannot say this unless you are constantly gaining wisdom and knowledge from God as the branch draws nourishment from the living vine. Unless his Holy Spirit is resting upon you and you are taking Jesus into your heart, thinking and talking of Jesus and doing his work wherever you are. This is the only way that we can work successfully in these last times. Christ was himself the example we should follow, not merely in outward form, but as he was in purity, self-denial, meekness, and love. So we should follow him in the world, his humiliation, his reproach, his crucifixion, and his cross he gave to his disciples. He also gave to them the glory that was given him. He said, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he oh, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, greater works, because I go to my Father. Let us commence right here in this meeting and not wait till the meeting is half through. We want the Spirit of God here now. We need it. We, and we want it to be revealed in our characters. We want the power of God here, and we want it to shine in our hearts. Brethren, let us take hold of the work as never before. Let us inquire, how is it with my soul? Is it in that condition that, will be, that it will be well with me? Shall Christ come and find me as I, am, as I now am? May God help us to be clean in spirit, pure and holy, manner of creation and godliness. Carrying on to the next chapter, unless someone has any thoughts on that last part. Carrying on to Tell, Tell of God's Love, Sermon, October 13, 1888, Manuscript 7, 1888. And an interesting note of the first page of this sermon is missing. Excuse me, I'm sure it should be great to find that somewhere. How can we understand God? How are we to know our Father? We are to call him by the endearing name of Father. And how are we to know him and the power of his love? It is through diligent search of the scriptures. We cannot appreciate God unless, he, unless we take into our souls the great plan of redemption. We want to know all about these grand problems of the soul, of the redemption of the fallen race. It is a wonderful thing that after man had violated the law of God and separated himself from God and was divorced, as it were, from God, that after all this there was a plan made whereby man should not perish, but that he should have everlasting life. After the transgression of Adam in Eden, it was Christ whom God gave to us. Not that we might be saved in, in our sins, but that we might be saved from our sins. That we should return to our loyalty to God and become obedient children. As we yield our minds, our souls, our bodies, and our all to the controlling spirit of God, it is then that the spirit of truth is with us, and we can become intelligent in regard to this great plan of redemption. It is true that God gave his only begotten son to die for us, to suffer the penalty of the broken law of God. We are to consider this and dwell upon it. And when our minds are constantly dwelling upon the matchless love of God to the fallen race, we begin to know God, to become acquainted with him to have a knowledge of God and of how Jesus Christ, when he came to our world, laid aside his royal robes and his kingly crown and clothed his divinity with humanity. For our sakes he became poor, that we, that we through his poverty might be made rich. The Father sent his Son here, right here on this little atom of a world where enacted the grandest scenes that, have, that were ever known to humanity 
all the universe was looking on with intense interest. Why? The great battle was to be fought between the power of darkness and the prince of light. Satan's work was to magnify his power constantly. Where was his power? He claimed to be the prince of the world, and he exercised his power over the inhabitants of the world. Satan's power was exercised in such a masterly manner that they would not acknowledge God. Satan wanted that the children of men should get such an idea of his wonderful work that they would talk of his masterly power. In doing this, he was all the time placing God in a false light. He was presenting him as a God of injustice, not a God of mercy. He was constantly stirring up their minds so that they would have an incorrect view of God. How is God to be rightly represented to the world? How is it to be known that he was a God of love, full of mercy, kindness, and pity? How is the world to know this? God sent his Son, and he was to represent to the world the character of God. Satan has come right in and placed himself between God and man. It is his work to divert the human mind, and he throws his dark shadow right athwart our pathways so that we cannot discern between God and the moral darkness and corruption and the mass of iniquity that is in our world. Then what are we going to do about the matter? Shall we let that darkness remain? No. There is power here for us that will bring in the light of heaven to our dark world. Christ has been in heaven, and he will bring the light of heaven, drive back the darkness, and let the sunlight of his glory in. Then we shall see, amid the corruption and pollution and defilement, the light of heaven. We must not give up the defilement that is in the human race. Give up at the defilement that is in the human race. And never keep that before the mind's eye. You must not look at that. What then are we to do? What is our work? To behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Do not let the blighting influences that are flooding the world be the picture that is before the mind. But hold up the purity and love of God. Do not hang in memory's hall pictures of all the corruption and iniquity that you can bundle together. No, do not do it. It discourages the mind. A discouraged man is good for nothing. Just get the mind off these dark pictures by talking of God's love, and you may hang memory's hall, memory's halls with the brightest pictures that you can imagine. We want to keep the perfect pattern before us. God was so good as to send a representation of himself in his son, Jesus Christ. And we want, to get, we want to get the mind and heart to unfold and reach upward. Just as soon as Adam and Eve fell, their countenances fell at the sight of their miserableness. We may see our wretchedness and we, may, and we should pray that God will reveal our own hearts to us. But we should pray also that he will reveal himself to us as a sin-pardoning redeemer. Let yours be the prayer. Reveal thyself to me, that in thy matchless grace I may lay hold on the golden link, Christ, which has been let down from heaven to earth, that I may grasp it and be drawn upward. Brethren, you have all seen on the bosom of the lake the beautiful white lily. How anxious we have been how we wished and worked that we might get that blossom. No matter how much scum and debris and filth there is around it, yet that does not destroy our desire for the lily. We wonder how the lily can, lily can be so beautiful and white where there is so much filth. Well, there is a stem that strikes down to the golden sands beneath and gathers nothing but the purest substance that feeds the lily until it develops into the pure and spotless power as we see it. Should not this teach us the lesson? It ought to. It, it shows that although there is iniquity all around us, we should not approach it. Do not talk of the iniquity and wickedness that are in the world, but elevate your minds and talk of your Savior. 
when you see iniquity all around you and it makes you all the more glad that he is your savior and we are his children. Then shall we look at iniquity around us and dwell upon the dark side? You cannot cure it. Then talk of something that is higher, better, and more noble. Talk of those things that will leave a good impression on the mind and will lift every soul up out of this iniquity into the light beyond. I have a asterisk here. You cannot cure it. And it reminds me of the idea that there are a lot of, there's a lot of evil that we, we're living in a world that Satan has large control over. And I can't, I can't change all that evil. I'm a finger in a bucket of water, pull it out, and that's how much difference I, I can have. Now, people will say that the more of us together, uh, we can make things happen. And, and, and this is true in the spiritual realm, for sure, and as well as in the world. So I'm not going to, I don't want to choose to use any influence I have in something that is directed at saving this world, saving this earth. I mean, I want to be a responsible steward, but I, at the same time, I'm not a joiner. I guess I could say I'm not a joiner in causes, especially ones that I cannot cure. And I find that uh, when we choose to dwell on so much bad stuff going on, that uh, we become anxious and sours the mind, really. So anyway, every soul will be lifted up into the light beyond if we, as we talk more of, of God without being so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good, of course, balance. Now, we may go into a cellar and stay there and look around into its dark corners. We may talk of the darkness and say, oh, it is so dark in here, and keep talking about it. But will it make it any lighter? Oh, no. What are you going to do? Come out of it. Come out of the dark into the upper chamber where the light of God's countenance shines brightly. You know our bodies are made up of the food assimilated. Now, it is the same with our minds. If we have a mind to dwell on the disagreeable things of life, it will not give us any hope. But we want to dwell on the cheery scenes of heaven. Says Paul, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we were in Switzerland, I had many letters from a sister whom I dearly love and highly esteem. In every one of these letters were the most gloomy pictures. She seemed to be dwelling on everything objectionable. Soon after I received these letters, I prayed the Lord that he would give her help to turn her mind from the channel that it was running in. That night I had a dream presented to me three times. I was walking in a beautiful garden and Sister Martha was by my side. As soon as she came into the garden, I said, Martha, do you not see these, this beautiful garden? See, here are the lilies, the roses, and the pinks. Yes, she said, as she looked up and smiled. Soon I looked to see where she was. I was looking at the lilies, the roses, and the pinks, and did not see her. She was in another part of the garden and was grasping at a thistle. Then she was pricking her hands on the bramble bushes, she said they hurt her hands, and she asked, Why do you keep all these thistles and these briars in the garden? Why do you let them stay here? Then there appeared before us a tall, dignified man who said, Gather the roses, the lilies, and the pinks. Discard the brambles and touch them not. Then I awoke, and when I went to sleep, I dreamed it the very same thing again. Three times I had the same dream, and I arose because I could not sleep and wrote to Sister Martha the dream I had had. Now, said I, God does not want us to gather up everything objectionable. He wants you to look at his wonderful works and at his purity. He wants you to take a view of his matchless love and his power. 
to look up through the beauties of nature to nature's God. Said I, this dream represents your case exactly. You are dwelling on the dark side. You are talking of those things that give no light and bring no joy into your life. But you must turn your mind from these things to God. There are enough roses, pinks, and lilies in the garden of God's love so that you need not look at the briars, the thistles, and the brambles. Now, I did not see these things because I was delighting myself with the flowers and all the beauties of the garden. Now, that is what we want to do, brethren. We want to have our minds on the encouraging things. We want to have our minds on the new country which we are to be introduced. Our citizenship is not of this world, but it is above. And we want to consider what characters we should possess in order to become inhabitants of that better world and associates of the saints of God in heaven. Sister Martha took it, and her soul was lifted above discouragement. Now, I do not want Satan to succeed in throwing his dark shadows across your pathway. I want you to get away from that shadow. The man of Calvary will throw the light of his love across your pathway and dispel the darkness. He is able to do it and will do it, for he is Lord of all. Somebody has thrown his light around you. It is Jesus Christ. I remember when my sister Sarah, now sleeping in the grave, who attended me in my first travels, I was in discouragement. She said, I had a strange dream last night. I dreamed somebody opened the door and I was afraid of him. And I continued to look at him. He increased in, As I continued to look at him, he increased in size and filled the whole space from the floor to the ceiling. And I continued to grow it more and more afraid. And I thought that I had Jesus. And I said, I have Jesus. I'm not afraid of you. Then he began to shrink and shrink until you could scarcely see him. And he went out of the door. It taught her a lesson. She said, Ellen, we talk a great deal more of the power of the devil than we have any right to. It pleases him. And his satanic man at majesty is honored. He exalts over it. And we give him honor in doing this. But, she said, I am going to talk of Jesus, of his love, and tell of his power. And so she brought her soul right out of darkness and discouragement into light. And she bore a living testimony for God and heaven. Now, I think our testimony would be a great deal better if we talked more of Jesus and his love and did not pay so much honor to the devil. Why should we not do it? Why not let the light of Jesus shine in our hearts? I remember that when I was in Oakland, there was a sister who was in great trouble. She said, my mother troubles me. My father is a good man. But my mother has her eyes fixed on so many young couples where the husband is disloyal that she seems to think her husband and everyone else is disloyal. I do not know what she will do or drive him to. She thinks he is unfaithful, and she talks of it and dwells upon it till she brings all her misery on the rest of us as though she were imposed upon when there is no need of it at all. Is not this the case with many of us? Do we not dwell on trifles and talk of them till our thoughts are charged to the same similitude, changed, changed to the same similitude? Do we not dwell on trifles and talk of them till our thoughts are changed to the same similitude? We can drive even our children to do wrong things by accusing them of wrongs of which they are not guilty, while we are to rebuke and exhort in all love. Should we not also exalt Jesus and talk of his love? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. It is one of Satan's devices that we should be picking up all these disagreeable things, and that our minds should not be dwelling on God and on and his love. That is what Satan wants, that we should keep our minds occupied with these things of a revolting character, that cannot bring peace, joy, and harmony into the life, nothing but discouragement, and that we should not represent Jesus Christ. Now, Christ left us his work when he went away and said, he said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We are not left alone in the hands of the devil. Do you think our Heavenly Father would leave us alone to carry on the work of redemption and bringing up the fallen race? That, we should, that he should leave us in a world 
flooded with evil, with no help, no support, after he had endured the agonies of the cross? Do you think he will leave us now? No, says the Savior. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And again, if I go away, I will come again. If he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is on the condition that we keep his commandments. Is not this a blessed promise? Why do we not talk of it more and praise God for it? Here are the precious promises of the word of God for it, to us, and why do we not take them? Now I want to read you something about this love of God and what we ought to do in order that we shall bring joy into our own hearts. Paul says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, not in order that we might have a taste, but that we might be filled, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his power, with all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. If we have a sense of the goodness of God in sending his Son to die for sinful man, and if we keep that interwoven into our experience and riveted in the mind, we shall have such love for those whom Christ died that there will be no desire for supremacy. It is Satan that brings in these differences. While we are worshipping God, there will be no hatred, no envy, no evil surmising. Brethren, we have no time for these. We cannot think of them. There is something else before us. It is the eternal weight of glory, the plan of salvation. We ought to understand it from beginning to the close, that we may present it justly to the world. What is our work here? We are to take hold of the work just where Christ left it. What was his work? To reveal the Father to us. What is our work? To reveal Christ to the world. How can we do this? By talking of the devil? Oh no, we have a better work to do. We want to talk of the crucified and risen Savior. Oh, what a terrible thing it would be for any of us to profess to be followers of Jesus Christ and then make a botch of it. And he find us with characters all stained with defilement. It's interesting language that she used to sometimes make a botch of it. What a fearful responsibility rests upon us. How is Christ to be revealed to the world? Unless it is through those who take hold on his merits, who believe in Jesus Christ, to the saving of their souls. He cleanseth me. He cleanseth me from the defilement of sin. And here let the sound be heard of what Christ has done for me. There is, <clears throat> there is liberty for the sons of God. There is a wide place for my feet to stand on. And we may have the fullness of the love of God in our hearts. I thank God that Christ has died for me and that I have been brought through a terrible ordeal of sickness and suffering of mind. It seemed as though the enemy cast a cloud of darkness between me and my Savior, and for twelve days it seemed that I could think of nothing but my sufferings. When I came to Oakland, my heart was so weak and feeble that it seemed that a stone was laying on it. Not a particle of joy was there in it. Not an emotion of gladness could I realize. But I was to think that heaven was close to me. Was I to think that heaven was close to me? No, I must take the Bible. And I took the Bible, and I walked right out by faith, and the darkness separated from me. To make it personal, I was that paragraph describes my experience from September until just about the new year. It was a really difficult time in my life, and uh, it was a good, good, because what needed to be done was was done in, in terms of healing. But uh, I identify with this last, and I'm sure each one of us have had times in our life where we felt like a stone was laying on our heart, couldn't breathe, hard to breathe even the deep griefs of life. 
When I awake in the night, I begin to pray. Some three weeks ago, I woke and said, Oh God, have mercy on me. I have no, I had no more than spoken when a voice by me seemed to say, I am right by you. I have not left you. This was everything to me. It may be just the same to you. Jesus says, I am right by you, dwelling with you. You are not alone at all. That was just the joy I experienced, and it was worth more than the mountains of gold to me, more than mountains of gold to me. I have learned to trust my Savior, and I want to tell you that I have a Savior, and he lives, and because he lives, I shall live also. Our lives are hid with Christ and God, and when he who is our life shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. You do not need to be discouraged. Christ came to save his people from their sins. The devil will come to you and tell you that you are a sinner and cannot be saved. But Christ says he came to save sinners, and there you can meet the devil every time. Christ can pardon your sins. He says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 118. Oh, I want you to take the rich promises of God and hang memories halls with them. What more could you want than that, than that promise? We have the assurance that a mother can forget her nursing child, but he will not forget us. Oh, I want the promises of God to be the living pictures on memory's walls, that you can look at them. Then your heart can be filled with his grace, and you may exalt Jesus and crown him Lord of all. That is your privilege. Now I want to read Colossians 1 verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. There is something to be patient and long-suffering over, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Yes, we should talk of deliverance, not of bondage. We should be joyful and not cast down, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Why can we not act as subjects of his kingdom? May the love of Christ burn on the altar of our hearts, and may you love Christ as your Savior and your brethren as yourself, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now we want to act like individuals who are redeemed by the blood of Christ. We are to rejoice in the blood of Christ and in the forgiveness of sins. That is what we are to do. And may God help us to get our minds off the dark pictures and think on those things that will give us light. Now I want to read another scripture. Be careful for nothing. What does that mean? Why, don't, take, don't cross a bridge before you get to it. Don't make a time of trouble before it comes. You will get to it soon enough, brethren. We are to think of today. And if we do well the duties of today, we will be ready for the duties of tomorrow. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Thanksgiving is to be brought in. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then we are not given over into the hands of the devil. We have a loving Heavenly Father, and he has given his Son to bear our iniquity. Now what is next? Finally, brethren, now this is to each of you. It comes along down the line to our times. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Shall we do it? Shall we turn over a page in our religious experience and train and educate the mind so that it will not take these things that are disagreeable and think on them? Shall we think on these things that give us no power? Or shall we let our minds dwell on those things that give us a better feeling toward our brethren and elevate our souls to God? 
Now, there are many things that we need to bring into our lives and characters. May God help us that we may take these things to our hearts and think of them, that our minds may be elevated above earthly things. We have seen of the grace of God since we met you. Last, sorry, we have seen the grace of God since we met you last. Since last spring, I have visited Lamor, Fresno, and Selma. I was at the Selma camp meeting. During my stay there, I was introduced to a tall man, over six feet tall, and well proportioned. When he took my hand, he seemed much affected and said, I am so glad to meet you. I am thankful that I can speak with you. After going into the tent, a brother came in and said, That man has a history. Then he went on and told how a year before he had been converted, how he had once kept the Sabbath but had gone back, and how he claimed that he never had been converted. Then after he gave up the truth, he went back into the company of hard cases, and Satan took complete possession of him. Two or three were linked with him in his wickedness, men who would not want it to be known. They were in such business. They stole and did wickedness in every way. He was not a licentious man. He had a wife, and he respected her. She was a Sabbath keeper, and he would, he would not allow a word to be said against her. This was the position he took. He loved her, but not enough to stop his evil course. He did not care for the spoil of his robberies, but did it for the enjoyment he found in it. Well, Elder E.P. Daniels was holding meetings, and he was speaking on confession that seemed to take hold of this man's mind, and he could not resist. He seemed to turn white, and then left the tent. He could not stand it. He went out, and he came back again. This he did three times. He looked as if he were going to faint away. After the meeting had closed, he said, I must talk to you, sir. He told Elder Daniels his condition and said, Is there any hope for me? I am a lost man. I am undone. I am a sinner. Will you pray for me? I dare not leave this place to go home, for fear the Lord will cut me down in my sins. He said he could not stay in the tent and went out again and again, but did not dare remain outside, for the fear of the power of the devil would fasten on him, and that would be the last of him. They prayed for him, and the man was converted right there. The defiant look was gone. His countenance was changed. Now, said he, I have a work to do. I stole 31 sheep from that man in Selma, and I must go and confess to him. Elder Daniels was afraid to have it known for fear they would shut him up, put him in jail. He said he would rather go to prison and stay there than to think that Christ had not forgiven his sin. So he started with a young man who before this was engaged with him in thefts to go and see the man. He met the man on the road and stopped him. The man commenced to shake like an aspen leaf. He was an infidel. Well, he got on his knees before them in the road and begged to be forgiven. The man asked, Where did you get this? What has brought you into this state? I did not know that there was any such religion as this. They told him that they had been down to the camp meeting and heard it preached there. Well, said he, I will go over to that meeting. They confessed to having burned houses and barns. And they went to the grand jury and confessed to having stolen here and there. Mind they confessed to the author mind they confessed to the authorities. They said we'd deliver ourselves up, do with it be fit. So the case was considered in the court, and they had a counsel over the matter. One suggested that they better put these men that they better put these men through. The judge looked at him and said, What? Put him through. Put a man through what that God is putting through? Would you take hold of a man that God is taking hold of? Whom God's forgiving power has taken hold of? Would you do that? No. I would rather have my right arm cut off to the shoulder. Something got a hold of those men so that they all wept as children. The report of that experience went everywhere. People thought that there was a power in this truth that was in nothing else. The power that shows that Jesus lives. We have seen the power of his grace manifested in many cases in a remarkable manner. 
Now, whenever we can see anything encouraging, put it in the paper and talk about it. Why talk of Satan's great power and his wonderful works and say nothing of the majesty and goodness and mercy of our God, which falls to the ground unnoticed? Pick these up, brethren, with consecrated hands. Pick them up. Hold them high before the world. Talk of the love of God and dwell upon it. Thank him for it. Open the doors of your hearts and show forth your gratitude and love. Clear away this rubbish which Satan has piled before the door of your heart and let Jesus come in and occupy. Talk of his goodness and power. You know how it was with Moses. He felt that he must have an answer to his prayer. He realized the responsibility of leading the people out of Egypt, but he did not go and pick up everything objectionable and dwell on it. He knew that they were a stiff-necked people, and he said, Lord, I must have thy presence. And the Lord said, My presence shall go with thee. You remember Moses went up into the wilderness and stayed forty years, during which time he put away self, and that made room so that he could have the presence of God with him. He thought if he could have the presence of God's glory, it would help him to carry on this great work. He says, show me thy glory. Now that was a man of faith, and God did not rebuke him. God did not call it presumption, but he took that man of faith and put him in the cleft of the rock and put his hand over the rock and showed him all the glory that he could endure. He made the goodness to pass before he made his goodness to pass before him and showed him his goodness, his mercy and his love. If we want God's glory to pass before us, if we want to have memories, halls hung with the promises of love and mercy, we want to talk of his glory and tell of his power. And if we have dark and miserable days, we can commit these promises to memory and take our minds off discouragement. It would please the devil to think he has bothered us, but we want to talk of Jesus and his love and his power because we have nothing better to talk of. Now, brethren and sisters, let us hope in God. Let gratitude enter into our hearts. And while we may have, a plain, have to bear plain testimony to separate from sin and iniquity, we do not want to be hammering upon that string forever. We want to lift up these souls that are cast down. We want them to catch the la that love of God and know that he will put his everlasting arms beneath them. Brethren and sisters, we want to look up, not down, but upward, upward, lifting the soul higher and still higher. I want these blessings, and I will not rest satisfied until I am filled with all the fullness of God. Nothing can be greater than that, can it? We want to be in that position where we shall be perfect a Christian character and represent Jesus Christ to the world. Christ has sent us, sent as our pattern. Christ was sent as our pattern. And shall we not show that we have all his love and kindness and all his charms? And the love of Jesus Christ will take possession of our characters and our lives. And our conversation will be holy. And we will dwell on heavenly things. I believe that Jesus is interested in all this assembly. He is here today. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He is with you, and that to bless. We want the blessing, and why should we not have it? We are to meet the moral darkness that is in the world, and we must meet it as Christ did. We must reveal Christ to all who are around us. When we do this work, we are abiding in Christ, and Christ is abiding in us. But only when we speak of him. But he is with us all the time to help us on every point, to press back the moral, the power of moral darkness. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He is not your enemy. He is your best friend, and he wishes us to show to the world that we have a God. He wants us to show that we have Jesus with us, and he is stronger than the strong man armed. 
Therefore, let us elevate our minds and our conversation and seek for heaven and heavenly things. God help us when we are in this position that we shall not be seeking after earthly things, but that we shall be charmed with the things of heaven. We want to behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I look at this congregation, and you look like discouraged men, like men who have been fighting with the powers of darkness. But courage, brethren, there is hope. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Oh, I love him, I love him, for he is my love. I see in him matchless charms, and oh, how I want that we shall enter in through the gates into that city, into the city. Then shall every crown be taken off from every head and cast at the feet of Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. He has purchased it for me. He has purchased it for you. And we shall acknowledge him, Lord of all. And we shall cast all our honor at his feet and crown him, Lord of all. We shall show glory to God in the highest. I wish we would learn to praise him more. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth God. I wish you would talk of it. I wish you would educate your hearts and lips to praise him, to talk of his power and his glory. I wish you would tell of his power. When you do it, you are elevating your Savior. And when you lift that standard up against your enemy, he will flee from you. God, help us to praise him more and to be found faultless. I'm not much a one for commenting on things, but it's almost like, what can you add to that? So that's the message there that I, I was impressed to share. Um, the whole series of sermons, if we have time, I'd like to share them as well. If I can carry on a little longer into the next one. Um, if that time time is I'm not sure how long this is supposed to be um, yeah actually this uh, next one is actually not too long I have lots of underlining in it so yeah I'll, I'll, I'll read read into the next one and just keep an eye on the time I guess if that's all right the need of advancement morning talk October 18 1888 review and Herald October 8 1889. I guess that's where it's published. I hope that at the beginning of this meeting, our hearts may be impressed with the positive statement of our Savior, without me, you can do nothing. And so I looked at that and I thought, underline positive. So, impressed with the positive statement of our Savior. Now, there's two ways that I thought of this. That Christ is saying posit that we can positive, that we it's positive, absolutely positive, that we can do nothing without him. That is certainly true. And the other way I looked at it was that uh, it's a positive statement in, in a way that once we know we can do nothing without Christ, that it becomes a positive thing because then, you know, in Christ only, Impressed with the positive statement of our Savior, without me, he can do nothing. We have a great and solemn truth committed to us for these last days. <clears throat> but a mere assent to and belief in this truth will not save us. The principles of the truth must be interwoven with our character and life. We should cherish every ray of light that falls upon our pathway and live up to the requirements of God. We should grow in spirituality. We are losing a great deal of the blessing we might have at this meeting because we do not take advanced steps in the Christian life as our duty is presented before us. And this will be an eternal loss. If we had just a just appreciation of the importance and greatness of our work 
and could see ourselves as we are at this time. We should be filled with wonder that God could use us, unworthy as we are, in the work of bringing souls into the truth. We would be filled with wonder that God could use us, unworthy as we are, in the work of bringing souls into the truth. There are many things that we ought to be able to understand that we do not comprehend, because we are so far behind our privileges. Christ said to his disciples, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. This is our condition. Would they not have been able to understand what he had to say to them, if they had been doers of his word, if they had improved point after point of the truth which he had presented to them? But although they could not then understand, he told them that he would send the Comforter, who would lead them into all truth. We should be in a position where we can comprehend the teaching, leading, and working of the Spirit of Christ. We must not measure God or his truth by our finite understanding or by our preconceived opinions. There are many who do not... (coughs) There are many who do not realize that they are where they are standing. They are spiritually blinded. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? I trust that none of us will be found to be reprobates. Is Christ abiding in your hearts by faith? Is his spirit in you? If it is, there will be such a yearning in your soul for the salvation of those for whom Christ has died, that self will sink into insignificance, and Christ alone will be exalted. Brethren and sisters, there is a great need at this time of humbling ourselves before God, that the Holy Spirit may come upon us. There are many content with the superficial knowledge of the truth. The precious truths for this time are brought out so clearly in our publications that many are satisfied and do not search the scriptures for themselves. They do not meditate upon the statements made and bring every proposition to the law and to the testimony to see if their ideas correspond to the word of God. Many do not feel that it is essential for them to compare scripture with scripture and spiritual things with spiritual, and therefore they do not grow in grace and in the knowledge of the truth, as it is their privilege to do. They accept the truth without any deep conviction of sin, and present themselves as laborers in the cause of God when they are unconverted men. One says, I want to do something in the cause of truth. Another says, I want to enter the ministry. And as our brethren are free to get all laborers, all the laborers they can, They accept these men without considering whether their lives give evidence that they have a saving knowledge of Christ. No one should be accepted as a laborer in the sacred cause of God until he makes manifest that he has a real living experience in the things of God. One reason why the church is in a backslidden state is that so many have come into the truth in this way and have never known what it is to have the converting power of God upon their souls. There are many ministers who have never been converted. They come to the prayer meeting and pray over the same old, and and pray the same old lifeless prayers over and over. They preach the same dry discourses over and over, from week to week and from month to month. They have nothing new and inspiring to present to their congregations. And it is evident that they are not eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of Man for they have no life in them. They are not partakers of the divine nature. Christ is not abiding in their hearts by faith. Those who profess to be united to Christ should be laborers together with God. The people of God are to warn the world and to prepare a people to stand in the day of wrath when the Son of Man shall come in the clouds of heaven. The members of the church of Christ should gather up the divine rays of light from Jesus and reflect them to others, leaving a bright track heavenward in the world. 
They are to be as the wise virgins, having their lamps trimmed and burning, representing the character of Christ to the world. We are not to be satisfied with anything short of this. We are not to be satisfied with our own righteousness and content without the deep movings of the Spirit of God. Christ says, without me, ye can do nothing. It is this marked nothingness, so apparent in the labors of many who profess to be preaching the truth, that alarms us. For we know that it is an evidence that they have not felt the converting power of Christ upon their hearts. You may look from the topmost bough to the lowest branch of their work, and you will find nothing but leaves. God desires us to come up to a higher standard. It is not his will that we should have such a dearth of spirituality. There are some young men that say they have given themselves to the work, who need a genuine experience in the things of God before they are fit to labor in the cause of Christ. Instead of going without the camp, bearing reproach for Christ's sake, instead of seeking the hard place and trying to bring souls into the truth, these beginners settle themselves in an easy position to visit those who are far advanced in experience. They labor with those who are more capable of teaching them than they are of teaching others. They go from church to church, picking out the easy places, eating and drinking, and suffering others to wait upon them. When you look to see what they have done, there is nothing but use. They bring in the report, I have preached here and I have preached there, but where are the sheaves they have garnered? Where are the souls that have embraced the truth through their efforts? Where is the evidence that their piety of their piety and devotion? Those who are bringing the churches up to a higher standard by earnest efforts as soldiers of Jesus Christ are doing a good work. Too often the churches have been robbed by the class I have mentioned, for they take their support from the treasury and bring nothing in return. They are continually drawing out the means that should be devoted to the support of worthy laborers. There should be a thorough investigation of the cases of those who present themselves to labor in the cause. An apostle, the apostle warns you to lay hands suddenly on no man. If the life is not what God can accept, the labors will be worthless. But if Christ is abiding in the heart by faith, every wrong will be made right. And those who are soldiers of Christ will be willing to prove it by a well-ordered life. There are many who enter the ministry and their influence demoralizes the churches. And when they are rejected, they take their dismissal as a personal wrong. They have not Christ in the soul as a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. I want to exhort those who are in positions of responsibility to awaken to their duty and not imperil the cause of present truth by engaging inefficient men to do the work of God. We want men who are willing to go into new fields and to do hard service for the Lord. I remember visiting in Iowa when the country was new, and I saw the farmers breaking the new ground. I noticed that they had heavy teams and made tremendous efforts to make deep roads, but the laborers gained strength and muscle by the exercise of their physical powers. It will make our young men strong to go into new fields and break up the follow ground of men's hearts. This work will drive them nearer to God. It will help them to see that they are altogether inefficient in themselves. They must be holy the Lord's. They must put away their self-esteem and self-importance and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When they do this, they will be willing to go without the camp and bear the burden as good soldiers of the cross. They will gain efficiency and ability by mastering difficulties and overcoming obstacles. Men are wanted for responsible positions, but they must be men who have given full proof of their ministry and willingness to wear the yoke of Christ. Heaven regards this class with approval. I exhort you to have the eye south, that you may discern what God would have you do. There are too many Christless sermons preached. An array of powerless words only confirms the people in their backslidings. May God help us that his spirit may be made manifest among us. 
We should not wait until we go home to obtain the blessing of heaven. The ministers should begin right here with the people to seek God and to work from the right standpoint. Those who have been long in the work have been far too content to wait for the showers of the latter rain to revive them. We are the people who, like John, are to prepare the way. We are prepared for the second, and if we are prepared for the second coming of Christ, we must work with all diligence to prepare others for Christ's second advent, as did the forerunner of Christ for his first advent, calling men to repentance. The truth of God must be brought into the soul temple to cleanse and purify it from all defilement. May God help us to search the scriptures for ourselves. And when we are all filled with the truth, and when we are all filled with the truth of God, it will flow out as water from a living spring. We cannot exhaust the heavenly fountain, and the more we draw, the more we shall delight to draw from the living waters. Oh, may we be converted. We want the ministers and the young men to be converted. We want to lift up the standard. Let all people come up to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray that we may hunger and thirst after righteousness. For Jesus says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Probably that's enough for today. Any thoughts on that, you guys? I know I think of Theodore being in Australia, plowing some hard ground. There's some stuff coming up in these, these sermons. Jumps off the page, and I I, I just, uh, let's see here. I'll just take a couple minutes to give a, what would you call a preview, but something to, yeah, preview that keeps people kind of anticipating. Now, keeping in mind, too, there, that these sermons, if you can imagine Ellen White in front of the general conference, so th- this is being directed at the men sitting in the in the congregation, the, these sermons. Um, one of the things that I know we all deal with, I'm sure, is the struggle that that we that we have when we when we consider ourselves in contrast to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that is the calling of having the character of Christ in our be our character. And in these like we can't do that. You know, like we just can't choose to be, well, we can choose, but man, I tell you, the struggle is real because oftentimes, I don't know, but often, but for sure, when, when I speak to my own experience that when I am faced with a choice between life and death, really sin or righteousness, that Oftentimes, I have chosen death, not caring for my own soul. And one of the things that that can that turns me back is not my own soul, but uh, I guess it's God showing me what, how my life can either help to save others or it can help to condemn others and to be a blessing or a curse. And and that's the thing that awakens in me uh, a repentance, a desire to be right, to choose right, is because I don't want to be a curse. I want to be a blessing. I I want to be in the lives of others, whether I meet them in the street, the cashier, having a bad day, you know, just to be patient and gracious when when things uh, don't go the way that you know they don't go smoothly, and and when people see that and say the teller serving, me, and I'm impatient, they see that it reflects back to me. They're impatient with me, 
and to be consistently patient with them when they're being impatient, it changes. The whole thing changes. The, the interaction, transaction, everything changes for better. And that's just a small little uh, example, I guess, or yeah, illustration of the bigger picture overall is that when the universe is able to see people react and love like Jesus, then they will be, I don't know, they're watching. They're watching us for to know we're safe to be saved. They're interested in the great plan of redemption from beginning to end. And to understand that plan and our part in it somehow has an a motivating thing to realize that and it is our privilege to lay our crowns at Christ's feet it will be our privilege to be one of the voices that acknowledge him as Lord of Lords and it'll mean something more than just an angel that has never fallen or uh, another being in a world in the unfallen worlds. When, when we're redeemed, we'll be redeemed from all that filth, you know, of this world, and we will be like a white lily. Isn't that a good thought, brothers? Well, um, anything, anything uh, at all. I'll, Give it a minute. And, well, what I want to say, really, what all that talking was about, is don't lose hope. I mean, don't sink down in discouragement. When we compare our characters to the character of Christ, we fall short. Hope is in seeing that, how far short we fall, but the hope is in, but, right, but Jesus. So... I like the promise that she mentions, like my profile picture, that the sinner, you know, when we realize how far down we are and how far apart we can be, we we cling to Christ with a white knuckle grip, but his grip is even stronger. That's pretty neat. Well, one day I'll get better control on my limbic <laughs> frontal lobe here with the emotions but it, it does touch me deeply because of, because of awareness of how far short we, I fall well, I'll close in prayer then Father in heaven we thank you so much for these words of admonition words of understanding and lead us deeper into it too in a practical sense because often we can despair become discouraged or fail to even try because the standard is so high remind us Lord that trying is turning to you in our weakness and our helplessness and in our need thank you that you cause us to be aware of our need in different ways whether it's through your word or the experiences of life. I want to pray for our brother Theodore as he's in a far off land and that you would strengthen him, give him wisdom, knowledge, and to that add under your understanding so that he's able to do what you have called him to do well there. Touch the hearts of the people and open their minds and hearts too to deeper things from your word and establish your work there, Lord. The work of calling men to repentance through a knowledge of truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and I want to pray too for our brother Colin. I've heard that he's in hospital or has been and we just pray for his health and his well-being, Lord. We pray that uh, he would know that he is cared for by us as well as especially by you 
Thank you for this time together. As we enter into the Sabbath, Lord, make it the blessing for us that, that we desire and so much need. A rest from this world and a rest in you. We thank you in Jesus' name.